Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. We have less than 20 men. England is mine, Albany. God's will bestowed it unto me. This castle belongs to me! Welcome to the second to last Quillette podcast of 2021, which I'm recording amid new lockdown provisions caused by the spread of the Omicron variant of COVID. If you're listening to this in late 2021, I hope you're COVID free and safe. And if you're listening to this in the future, well, please enjoy this morbid little time capsule from what I hope turns out to be the tail end of this by now two year pandemic. Anyway, what you just heard is a snippet from the poorly reviewed 2011 action film Ironclad, in which a tiny band of 13th century knights tries to hold an important castle against the evil English King John, played by Paul Giamatti, who you heard just there. As one might expect, the creators took extensive liberties with historical events, but at the heart of the narrative is a real historical truth. Back in those early days, even very small castle garrisons could hold off large armies, because it was really difficult to besiege a castle with the technology of the time. That changed radically with the introduction of gunpowder, and therefore artillery, from China in the 14th century, a development that had enormous military and, as it turned out, political ramifications. No longer could small, isolated local lords hold out against large political actors a power imbalance that would only become more acute centuries later during the Industrial Revolution. With me to discuss the effect of gunpowder on the course of history is Wright State University professor Paul Lockhart, author of the excellent new book, Firepower, How Weapons Shaped Warfare, who recently spoke to me over the phone from his home in Ohio. So the title of this book is Firepower, How Weapons Shaped Warfare. But it doesn't take long in reading it before you realize that uh, it isn't just how weapons shaped warfare, it's how they shaped politics and our understanding of what a state is and how Europe in particular organized itself in the centuries following the introduction of gunpowder. I I realize authors don't always pick their own titles, but it it kind of sells your thesis short. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, that, uh, honestly, I, I, that there's a title that 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 caused me some some hesitation. I wasn't sure exactly how to title it. Originally, in fact, I'd had a longer title: "How Weapons, How Weapons Shaped the West in the Age of the Gun," or something like that. Um, and and the age of the gun was important to me at that point because that was obviously determining the parameters. It's it is about gunpowder firearms for the most part and systems that carry them. But but you're right, and this is something that while I was familiar with having, you know, having taught the history of military technology for years, was well aware of, it really wasn't until I put it all together in, in written form that I really began to notice how, you know, how pervasive the influence of, or how widespread the influence of, of firearms, of, of weapons development in the West has been. The first cannons that were produced by I guess what we would now call large states or empires, often these were, these were one-off constructions. Some examples are from the Kingdom of Sweden, where there are surviving specimens, this fabulously ornate inscriptions. Then as the, the decades wore on, governments realized, well, we don't just need one or two of these things. We need like hundreds of them, especially if we're going to put them on ships. You describe how this became what we would now recognize as a sort of mass industrial enterprise. And the only political organizations that could manage or finance that sort of thing were things that kind of resembled a modern nation state. Well, even before the Industrial Revolution, of course, we have this development that that Michael Roberts labeled back in the 1950s, the military revolution, which has you know, attracted a lot of debate amongst historians, especially of, of Europe and the, you know, the age of the Renaissance and the Reformation and the, and the Enlightenment. 
And you know, the connection there is that a combination of a, a, a definite, obvious, a huge change in military technology, namely the, you know, the introduction of gunpowder firearms, first in the form of artillery, later small arms, changes the way that armies fight. Uh, changes the economies of scale where it comes to warfare. That, um, you know, for example, using musket and pike only really works well with larger armies. Armies grow. Armies grow not only in size, but also in terms of the infrastructure and in terms of the resources that they need. Um, and the, you know, the, the early modern state, you know, the state before the French Revolution, while it's not solely a product of this, this is in large part a product of the, uh, of the necessity to, to marshal resources not only for more frequent wars and for longer and more battle-intensive wars, but for larger armies consuming larger amounts of, of military technology. The Industrial Revolution ups that, obviously, in, in, in a number of ways. And you know, to me, the Industrial Revolution affects weapons technology, the evolution of, of weapons technology in, 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 in a number of ways. One of them, of course, is the, is the pace at which uh, weapons become more sophisticated, um, simply because the Industrial Revolution... Uh, changes the way that innovation is thought of. It changes the the dynamic between inventor and manufacturer and end consumer, namely military establishments. But it also, it, it, as you pointed out, the Industrial Revolution, uh, by making it not only possible but but necessary uh, to produce uh, gigantic quantities of of weapons, it has a definite impact on the the constellation of powers as you might have in 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 the in the nineteenth and, and into the twentieth centuries, to the point that as I as I think I mentioned in, in the book, you know, in in 1864, for example, a war that we uh, that we don't often think about, the Second Schleswig War, where Prussia and Austria invade Denmark. Important to me because you know, Danish history is a is a favorite field of mine. That Denmark, although it was outclassed. Uh, on land, actually fielded a halfway decent army and was victorious, at, uh, almost victorious at sea. Denmark could still maintain a decent navy because the technology had not gotten yet to the point where only major industrial powers could keep up with the weaponry in the sophistication and the quantities required. But after that point, as we get into the 1870s and 1880s, it's really increasingly only those states that, that are developing uh, strong industrial economies that can keep up anymore. And you know, one, of, one of the better examples, I think, uh, coming out of the First World War is, uh, is Austria-Hungary, um, which, you know, Austria, a major military power throughout the, you know, the early modern period and through, through the 19th century. And as we get to the First World War, it just doesn't have the ability to support a large military in the way that Germany, France, Britain, or the United States, or even Russia did. Military technology not only plays a role in creating, I think, what we would consider to be the modern nation state with a centralized government fueled by taxes, primarily for, as its lifeblood, um, but also the um, restriction of uh, the, the number of states that could actually act as, uh, as independent actors in, uh, in, in international politics, uh, so that states that once could, you know, Sweden's a prime example, Sweden, the major power in the 17th century, powers like Sweden by the end of the 19th century are, are more or less at the mercy of much larger states like Germany, France, Britain, you know, Russia, for example. You talked about Musket and Pike, and there's one particularly evocative section of your book, Battle of Bacocha, is that correct? Bacocha, yes. Uh, now, this is 1522. It's the time of uh, Francis I. This is a time when, when southern France, northern Italy, it was just this big mess of sort of dynastic claims and, and constant warring. This battle you describe, it involved Swiss pikemen. <laughs> I didn't know this. The, the pikes they carried were 18 feet long. It's this, this really interesting case study in this sort of inflection point in warfare Bacocha, in, in histories of the Italian wars of the, in the early 16th century, frequently comes up as a, an example of um, how the tactics are changing. But it's, it's not by any means the first, the first battle in Europe where we see massed firepower used, but it's probably the most obvious. Although the, the armies at, at Bacocha are pretty standard for the early 16th century, in other words, there is a mix of shock weapons and missile weapons, of, of, of pike and either handheld firearms and crossbows, and artillery on both sides, and a lot of mercenaries. I think the Swiss appeared as mercenaries. Yes. 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 The Swiss. You know, the Swiss were at the cutting edge of, of tactics in the century prior, the century and a half prior to Bicocca. 
Um, they had established themselves as established a reputation for themselves as not only ferocious warriors, but extraordinarily well disciplined so that a Swiss pike block, you know, a, a unit of Swiss soldiers wielding 18 to 21 foot pikes gained a reputation of, of a tactical unit that could not be driven from the field, but could drive almost anything before it. Like a veteran Roman legion. Yes, but but oddly, without the kind of political infrastructure or administrative sophistication that the Romans have. This is a, entirely a homegrown, these are homegrown local militias that we see in the, the Swiss cantons. Um, but because of that, that reputation, they were courted by the, early, by the late 15th century as mercenaries, and they tended more often than not to go for French gold. So at Bacocha, the Swiss mercenaries are fighting for the French. But it's whole, wholly as mercenaries. The, the, the reason the, the battle happens on that particular day in 1522 is because the Swiss have given an ultimatum to the French commander, which is that we haven't been paid, we haven't had a chance to fight, give us a chance to fight or we leave. And, and what's interesting is that when you read these stories, these guys wanted to fight. Oh, yeah. These battles were unspeakably savage. I certainly would <laughs> do anything in my power to avoid them, but... These guys, I mean, it was it was about honor and plunder. Yeah, well, even even if they're not paid, there's a chance to uh, to, to pillage enemy baggage tra- uh, trains, etc. So yeah, so the, the the Swiss represent a by now well established uh, way of making war, a means of, of infantry tactics. Uh, but it's already been demonstrated that firearms could be the undoing of the Swiss. Artillery fire, of course, will you know wreak tremendous damage with a with a unit packed as tightly together as a Swiss pike block was. The modern aspect of the um, of Bicocha is the fact that the Spanish the Spanish and Italian army prepares for this assault by essentially digging formidable field fortification, placing artillery and gun emplacements. Of course, they have an evening to prepare for the battle on the next day, and then manning the manning the fortifications with arquebusiers, an arquebus being an early you know a base, essentially a short musket, and by by means of volley fire. And the volley fire is kind of critical. Volleys do not compensate, as, I've, as some military historians would like to say, do not compensate for the inaccuracy of an arquebus. It's just that a whole mass of men going down at once is a lot more demoralizing than a man going down every now and then. Volley fire, just to be clear, that's when you know, fire discipline is exercised and a commander says shoot and everybody shoots at once. Yes, and that's critical. You know, we often forget how critical that is in, in tactics, especially um, before the advent of, of more rapid fire weapons in the 19th century. Um, that, that volley fire not only has, a, has, a, has a, um, an effect on enemy morale, because after all, the, the purpose of, of firing on the enemy is to disrupt or destroy his cohesion. Um, so they can be pushed back or, or pushed from the field. But with, uh, with volley fire also, like you mentioned, fire discipline is key uh, because, especially with, with, uh, with less experienced soldiers, the instinct is there to fire on your tormentor or your attacker as soon as you see them or as soon as they fire at you. And, and so for, to have, a, uh, have an army in which men with missile weapons, in this case arquebusiers, don't fire until their officers judge that it is, in fact, the ideal time to fire. So it can be timed exactly right. That's critical. Otherwise, you'll have men just shooting whatever they want. So just to set the scene here, you have a confident attacking force, high morale, attacking set fortifications, favorable terrain for the defender. Almost like um, four centuries later, I think World War One commanders would would recognize this kind of dynamic. Oh, it's funny. I, I, years ago, the first time I taught a uh, course on um, the art of warfare in early modern Europe, uh, I, I used the battle without giving commanders names or dates or names of nationalities involved. I just described it as something like a uh, massed enemy carries on a uh, you know, frontal assault with uh, essentially with shock weapons towards an entrenched army with firearms and you describe the carnage that follows. And I asked if anybody could identify the battle, the earliest battle it could possibly be. The first hand was raised in Cold Harbor, 1864. Well, yeah, I can see why you would derive that from. And, 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 this, and of course, this uh, kind of pushes back against the notion that we don't see frontal assaults against, against field fortifications being blown to smithereens until the American Civil War. It seems quite a, it's, it's quite, it really uh, is, uh, is uh, contemporaneous with the introduction of, of the handheld firearms. The Swiss, they just kept going on, even when it, the tactical situation looked hopeless. Were lessons learned from this kind of battle saying, musket and pike, we need more musket, less pike? Lessons are definitely learned, but maybe not yet the more musket, less pike thing just yet. Um, and again, that's partly because 
early firearms have significant limitations. The the big one being, you know, less the accuracy is not all that important since almost all firefights you know, for the next several centuries will take place at 100 yards or, or closer. And if you're firing against a masked target, individual accuracy doesn't matter. You don't have to hit an enemy, you have to hit the enemy. And there's a, you know, a big difference there. But the rate of fire of matchlock long arms, whether it's an arquebus or a musket, it's not great. And we're talking about roughly about around a minute. And so there, there are certain points at which musketeers are very vul- or arquebusiers are very vulnerable. You know, for example, while the enemy's coming close, if they are not loaded, that that's why you know we want to press an assault. You make sure the last few yards of it are done very very quickly. Also, because they have no shock weapons of their own, musketeers don't have quite the same success at driving a broken enemy from the field the way that a pike unit would. Because all they have is a musket. The bayonet has not been invented yet. So it's seen very much after Bacocha as a complementary thing. You have to have musket, you have to have pike. They work very well together, missile and shock. That, that's really going to be the, the, uh, the center point of, of tactical development in the West from this point until really the end of the 17th century, is how do we balance fire and shock? Increasingly, the, the, uh, the, the conviction is that we still need shock, but we want to develop more firepower, volume and speed. And, and so the introduction of drill, of course, speeds that. Um, the, the drill systems that we see at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th centuries, uh, also that allow flexible co- tactical combinations responding to changing conditions on the battlefield. And then with the introduction of, of flintlock muskets, you know, which really don't appear in huge numbers in European warfare until the latter part of the 17th century, uh, we have a significantly increased rate of fire. So, so as, you, as you increase the rate of fire and, and make units more, more tactically flexible, you can start elongating. They have you know, elongating formations so that your, your battle line is wider and you're able to use more muskets at one time and keep fewer in reserve. And there's a political aspect here too, because to the extent this technology requires constant drilling, your military force can't just be a bunch of local hotheads that you call up, raise the banners and and summon them to the battlefield. It has to be, in many cases, a professional corps of soldiers who comprise a standing army. Drill, which allows that kind of tactical flexibility and to maximize the rate of fire that you can get out of your weapons, to maximize your firepower, in other words, uh, require soldiers who are being trained, you know, around not around the clock, but hours every day, day in and day out, uh, in in war and in peace. Uh, and and so yes, by the time we get to the end of the 17th century, the European states are depending almost exclusively on standing armies of professional trained soldiers. And of course, there were analogous developments when it came to ships of the line in navies. It wasn't just one-off massive boats that were commissioned on the caprice of the king. It was, it was standardized ships with sailors who knew how to use the cannon. And uh... Oh, yeah. In fact, with navies, it's a little bit faster, in fact, because you know, first of all, it's, it's difficult to have... It's difficult to have an untrained navy. <laughs> you, can, you, can train, you can train infantrymen relatively quickly, uh, at least to do the basics. But training sailors isn't something you do exactly on the fly. And, and so, so ships have to be manned, especially once you start building ships that are dedicated warships, not just merchant ships that are armed and can be used for war. Um, but once you have dedicated warships, this means that it's, you know, it's absolutely essential that you have trained crews that are ready to go. And all, nothing else also to make sure that the ships are maintained because they require you know, constant maintenance so they don't rot. Uh, and, and navies are even more demanding in terms of resources than armies are. Not just the number of men, uh, not just the constant maintenance, but naval facilities, the ordnance, you know, the large number of cannon on board. Navies, more, before armies do, navies really require specialized bureaucracies that are devoted just to them which is definitely part of the expansion of the power of the, of the nation state. You have a fascinating chapter on the logistics of getting dozens of cannon onto a boat, especially in the early days. Each of these cannon, if improperly used, was, was kind of a, a bomb that, that could blow up a section of, of the boat. Yeah. A lot of people listening to this will, will probably be familiar with Jared Diamond's classic, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Right. We associate guns, gunpowder, and the metallurgy that went along with it with... European civilization, you make the point that this technology was old hat to the Chinese at the time it was adopted widely by the Europeans. Could you explain why all of these enormous political changes and military changes associated with gunpowder 
why our focus is not primarily on East Asia as opposed to Europe? That's a really good question. Recently, scholars working in, again, what we might call early modern, you know, before 1800, before the Industrial Revolution, the history of, of Asia have pointed out that we see within Asia, within, within China, within Japan, even within Korea, a um, you know, s- significant parallels with Europe in terms of, for example, drill, professionalization, volley fire, you know, the infantry tactics have some, some really, really interesting parallels. The real divergence uh, happens with the Industrial Revolution that both increases exponentially Europe's ability, the West's ability to, uh, to manufacture military goods as well as many other things very, very rapidly and according to standardized patterns. At the same time, the, the, military, the, the Industrial Revolution sparks unprecedented acceleration in the pace of technological development in, in, in weapons. So where, you know, where, uh, where European weaponry doesn't change much from, say, 1500 to 1800. After 1800, especially after 1850, European weaponry is uh, just simply surpasses anything else available in the world. The difference between the sophistication of European military technology at the end of the 19th century and that of Asian military technology is, uh, with a few exceptions, I mean, obviously, the, the, the Japanese who have worked closely with Europe to develop both the modern army and the modern navy, but but by and large, Europe's superiority militarily and strategically is uh, is really a product of the Industrial Revolution. As late as World War II, some version of musket and pike was still being used by some armies. I, I think certainly Japanese infantry, many of them went into battle with swords. Is there a date that we could finally identify at the time that, that modern armies abandoned non-gunpowder weapons? Not really. You know, a, a big point of contention to me here is the bayonet. The bayonet obviously is still considered to be an integral part of, a, of an infantryman's equipment. The, the general assumption is that somewhere in the middle of the 19th century, the, the bayonet becomes irrelevant. And it doesn't. This is a point I, I like to make. First of all, a weapons effectiveness is not entirely a matter of how many people it can kill within a given period of time. You may recall from the book, you know, one, of the, one of the principal merits of, of the machine gun as first used in the First World War was that it could achieve significant tactical goals without killing anybody. Uh, in particular, through the you know, through the uh, the application of beaten zones and, and and cones of fire, you could deny use of ground to an enemy without actually killing anyone. And and the same thing with the bayonet, just like with the pike. Yes, the bayonet and the pike is is a weapon you you can use to skewer somebody. But the the effectiveness of the Swiss pike blocks wasn't entirely based on them actually even drawing close to the enemy in, in, in close combat, but the moral effect of seeing hundreds of pikes leveled at chest height coming towards you. Because one thing that uh, Western military writers have noted throughout the 18th and 19th centuries in particular was that veteran troops could withstand hours of being shot at and still hold. But very often the same veteran troops simply could not stand the prospect of being skewered. And so an, an enemy infantry line advancing with the bayonets enough to make them break and run. And so for all the argument that, for example, the bayonet is obsolete by the time, time of the American Civil War, it can find up, you know, lots, of, lots of counterexamples and show the bayonet works really, really well. Whether or not it actually kills anybody is, is kind of immaterial. So shock weapons still have their place. The bayonet, which is essentially an evolution of the pike, maintains its relevance well into the 20th century, at least. If you're a regular listener to the Quillette podcast, you'll be familiar with BetterHelp, one of our original advertisers. Well, thanks to everything that's happened since early 2020 and the stresses that the pandemic has put on everyone, the online therapy services at BetterHelp are more relevant and in demand than ever. BetterHelp will help you unlock the tools you need to help with motivation, depression, anxiety, battling your temper, stress, dealing with insecurity in relationships or at work, whatever you need. Especially at a time like this, no one should be anxious about admitting that they're going through normal human struggles, because you deserve to be happy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. And you don't even have to see anyone on camera if you don't feel comfortable doing so. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really about. And Quillette Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month by visiting 
betterhelp.com slash Quillette. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Quillette. Thanks to BetterHelp for their sponsorship. And now back to the Quillette podcast. Before gunpowder was around, the castle was king. Every local feudal lord wanted their own Maginot line. And when the only tools you had to attack were pointy things and big rocks, it was great to have this gigantic structure with 10-foot walls that, that no one could effectively attack. And then suddenly you get these, these enormous cannon that it didn't matter how thick your walls were. Given days or weeks of pounding by siege weapons, you could knock the thing down. Castles are, are meant to basically withstand being climbed over. Uh, and it's possible to reduce. Any castle can be reduced, but the investment in time is not always worth it. And your army is getting cholera. And... Oh, yeah. And, and, and you're dealing with, with, with armies, especially those based on, on feudal commitments that might only be obligated to be in the field for 30 or 60 days. So, so the time to, required to invest the castle is, is very often not worth it. As long as the defender has adequate supplies of, of water and food, uh, and epidemic disease doesn't become a huge issue, they can hold out almost indefinitely. Also a great deal of political significance there, too, because this is one of the, it's, it's the existence of the castle, a kind of fortification that virtually any uh, nobleman of means could, could build that is, a, is an obstacle to centralized authority, prevents the growing European monarchies from really exerting complete authority over their, over their nobles. Artillery, of course, just makes castles completely obsolete and virtually no time flat. And you know, the, the really dramatic ones coming from the late, coming from the um, um, early 15th century involve walls being breached in hours. It's almost to the point that, that defenders of a castle, as soon as they see a siege train, as soon as they see cannon being brought up, immediately surrender because they know they don't have a prayer. Except when they have their own cannon, because that was one of the, the adaptations. Oh, right. Well, here, here I'm referring to castles, you know, which are not artillery fortifications. But yet that, that, that brings about a continent-wide search for, for means of building a fortification that's artillery resistant. And you know, between really, really thick walls or the advent of outer works like so-called boulevards and uh, artillery towers. The one that ends up becoming the you know, kind of the universal solution is the so-called tr Italian trace. But the core of it is, is packed earth, and packed earth is absorbent, and, and, and masonry is not. The Italian trace also has a great advantage of, of being easily made into an artillery fortress with relatively squat walls with a with significant slope to them, bastions, protruding bastions that allow virtually no dead space. Almost any space in front of a castle can be covered with artillery or small arms fire. That changes sieges somewhat. It doesn't make them unbesiegeable, but it certainly means the investment in, in uh, uh, besieging an artillery fortress is going to be a, a huge one in terms of men, materials, and time. Now, there is, in North America, there is a one fort that I know of, I, the only one I know of, that is really a pure Italian trace fortress. And that's the Castillo de San Marcos in, um, in St. Augustine, Florida. I mentioned that to my students. Quite a few of my students have you know, gone to St. Augustine at one point or another, whether, whether it's for spring break or something else. And you know, after having told them Italian trace fortresses are very squat, and, and low, and you know they've they've stood at the base of uh, the Castillo de San Marcos and said that's not squat, that's really tall. Well, compared to a castle, it's quite squat. It's it's also the the development of the artillery fortress, which becomes something that along with navies is one of those elements that European states see as an existential matter that they have to invest in them. It's not a, not a choice. If you want to maintain the security of your of your frontiers. You have to invest in modern fortifications, and fortifications like navies are really, really expensive. Again, you're getting back to that issue that so much of the development of, of the modern centralized bureaucratic state works alongside this need to mobilize resources to keep up with military technology. Before I let you go, I want to ask you a little bit about some of the innovations that took place in North America. Of course, during the Napoleonic period in, in the early 19th century, you had mass armies fighting by the hundreds of thousands. In the War of 1812, and also earlier, I guess, in the American War of Independence uh, in the late 18th century, you had what we would now call maybe guerrilla-style tactics, including in the War of 1812, indigenous allies to the British 
created their own kind of tactics, which didn't rely on volley fire, small forces traveling by canoe. Oh, yes. Yes, so very, and, and more than is commonly recognized. To what extent did that kind of tactic in North America, did that ever shape the, the use of firearms back in Europe? The typical narrative, for example, about the American Revolution, where it comes to tactics, is the British fight in these ridiculously formal, formalized linear tactics and Americans all, you know, uh, fight fight like indigenous peoples. They're hiding behind rocks and trees. They're taking advantage of cover. And you know, we know from more recent research into the American Revolution that, of course, this is, you know, for the for the most part wrong. But the main thing that 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 bugs me about that, and I'm getting back to your question, is the the British were well acquainted with wilderness warfare and irregular uh, regular warfare before. The American Revolution. There's a there's a light infantry movement that kind of sweeps European armies in the middle of the, the middle of the 18th century, and it's conditioned by several different experiences of fighting irregular forces. The British, for example, fighting in in the Scottish Highlands, like in the 45 uprising, for example, fighting going on between French and Austrian troops, essentially mountain fighting in the War of the Austrian Succession. But more than anything else, it's the experience of the British Army in North America during the Seven Years' War slash French and Indian War, where they developed very detailed and, and uh, experience-driven, experience-grounded tactics uh, for light infantry. People like, for example, like uh, Thomas Gage, the British commander in Boston at the beginning of the Revolution, or William Howe, who was a British overall British commander for a good part of the early part of the war, uh, were accomplished light infantrymen and were more than familiar with the ranging tactics, for example, that were used by groups like like Rogers Rangers during the Seven Years' War. Um, so yeah, that that light infantry movement is in large part spurred by North American conditions and the experience of fighting American colonials and and Native Americans, and and it's definitely visible as we get to the to the Napoleonic Wars, where light infantry units uh, have become even more prominent. You know, the whole concept of light infantry is soldiers who can fight both conventionally and also fight uh, irregular forces emerges in the middle of the 18th century and largely because of American warfare, but it accelerates as we get into the 19th. So yeah, there's a huge influence, I think, of American warfare on European in that way. Paul Lockhart is professor of history at Wright State University, where he's taught military and European history for more than 30 years. His other books include The Drill Master of Valley Forge and The Whites of Their Eyes. He lives in Dayton, Ohio, and his new book is called Firepower, How Weapons Shaped Warfare. Thanks so much for being on the Quillette Podcast. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events.